Um, hi everyone, okay. thanks for coming again. So this is BOF, um, so hopefully this will just be conversation and discussion. Um, so we've got a bunch of different points here. We just have this one slide as just like points to talk about. Um, so the title of this BOF was like, oh, how do we upstream the GCC, I guess? Um, so discussion around. No. discussion around upstreaming GCC soon. Yeah. And yeah, that's the points that we're going to talk about. So we have the second version of the patches out at the moment. The first version of the patches, we had a bunch of stuff um, to do for target hooks and stuff like that, which turned out to be a bit of a nightmare and we don't really need it yet. We will need it when we start compiling lib standard, which hopefully be soon in the start of the new year. Um, so I was talking to Ian last night about this, about a better approach about doing that. So hopefully we can find some uh, crossover there. Um, it's the same problem. Um, hopefully we don't have to just reinvent the wheel. <laughs> um, also, I think if you have questions about the previous talk, you can also take them because oh, yeah. Yeah, we were a bit short. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, apart from that, the, uh, the that version of the patches, I sort of, I didn't split them up enough at the time for the first version, but the second version split up a fair bit. Uh, there was only one missing patch that was there, but it's pretty trivial, uh, which turned out to be kind of funny. Um, there's actually a switch statement in like, in the PowerPC backend based on the language, and it just hits a GC on Reachable that if it because it doesn't know about GNU Rust or whatever, which is kind of funny. But yeah, that, that's a pretty trivial one. Um, so, so far there's been a couple of the patches have been approved so far, but I think it's going to take a while to get through the actual full front end. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work because it's a lot of specific code, I guess, to get through, but people yeah. are reviewing it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> and, um, yeah, one big difference between the release process of GCC and the release process of Rust is that, as we mentioned, Rust releases a new version every six weeks, but GCC has a new version every year. Uh, I mean, a new major version every year yeah. at least. And so we need, to, we need to figure out a way to sort of synchronize and still provide movement on the GCC RS side without affecting the GCC sides of things. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't fully understand. Oh. Yeah. So if they release every six weeks, what, what are the changes that we expect to see like in, in, in a year's time? Yeah, so... There, so there, as far as I understand, the, the core language is pretty stable in between. So is it mostly library side features or... Because we would, like we do, we do have uh, libgo basically syncing at points Ian chooses, and uh, the libd runtime also syncs whenever the other Ian that's spelled differently but pronounced the same uh, decides. <laughs> so, I th um, so the, the only thing to, to watch out for is of course uh, ABI stability if there's something like a shared library coming out of Rust, the Rust runtime, I'm not sure if it, there is. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's a few different things you could mention there. Like um, in Rust, there's two symbol mangling schemes. We've done the first one and it has a hash at the end of it. So it's pretty unstable. I think that's why there's not, people don't use shared libraries very often in Rust because you have to make sure you're, everything's using the same version of the compiler or you won't be able to link because it's based on just random information at the end of the symbol. But there's a new version of the mangling scheme which is coming out and it's almost stable or might just be stable. <laughs> yeah, and also regarding the changes that come into a six week release, most of the changes aren't actually to the language, but as you mentioned, to the libraries. So because uh, the core and standard and our library ship with the compiler, when they change, uh, that's also reflected in the version changes. So most changes will be, for example, the stabilization of a function or an attribute or, yeah, some stuff like that that doesn't necessarily require compiler changes. I think the most important change recently was the, I mean, recently, a few years ago, few months was the const generics yeah. uh, between 149 and 150 and we also got uh, generic associated types now which are being stabilized yeah. or stabilized 
and that's going to require compiler changes. But yeah, there's, there's not much. As for my understanding, are you, talking? are you talking about merging to stable GCC branches? What, sorry? Are, are you talking about new OS versions to stable GCC branches or to, to the GCC, GCC development branch? Um, I guess stable, I guess. Uh, but then we would like to make sure it's marked in such a way that it's not finished. Um, yeah, basically we're trying to figure out what's the best path forward here. We're trying to figure out what the answer is and David might have a good... Well, no, I mean, I don't, I don't think that was a use, the, the, the correct way of asking the question. I mean, look, the, the issue is that when they're going to merge this into the version of GCC that gets released, this isn't going to be updating, I mean, just as, you know, as Richard was saying, Go and D already set a precedent for this and that there are other communities, other implementations go on their schedule and we sync at appropriate times for the GCC release and that's what we'll do for Rust as well. And that it needs to go in and that, you know, they don't backport, I mean, other than bug fixes, we don't backport new changes into release branches. So it's a matter of what goes into the upcoming release, the yearly release. And so that'll be whatever uh, version, and as, as Richard was saying, you know, Ian Taylor, you know, brings in the appropriate version and syncs with Go at, we're about to get into a release of GCC and get the latest version of that. Um, as we were also discussing at the previous conversation downstairs at the presentation, that there is a general issue of stability in Rust and that, um, and, and tension, shall we say, within the Rust community itself about, and you know, the different factions in the Rust community about what stability they need or want in their different development models and, and the requirements that Rust, you know, Linux, including Rust, will require on its own. So I think that, um, it, that you know, the Rust is, I, I don't say it has to, but I mean, they're clearly at, at for certain types of enterprise adoption, certain workloads, it's going to have to require some stability, including Linux. And I think that, you know, not, not that G is trying to, GC is not trying to change Rust, not trying to change the community or development model or anything about that, but as uh, Rust is the, uh, becomes more uh, widely adopted and utilized in different types of workloads, different types of scenarios that with a user community or at least a, a subset uh, that requires this. For example, in Linux, I mean, there's a long-term releases. The long-term release, I mean, yes, you know, Linux has whatever it's scheduled for releases, but that's not what a Linux distro doesn't, you know, doesn't have every single update and there's specific Linux kernel long-term releases and there's specific Linux uh, distributions long-term releases and those need to be supported for six years or more. And so that's mm -hmm. going to, and uh, it's not practical, it's not going to be possible for a Linux module written in Rust to be in, in those long-term releases, which are only supposed to have bug fixes, to you know have, you know, work off nightly. I, I mean, that's just not, you know, that, that's no, nobody's going to accept that. So there is going to have to be some sort of a pacing for Rust that then, you know, GCC can can follow in some sort of conformance for what a Rust official releases are. Should I give the mic or answer? Um, yeah, um. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I think just one thing to keep in mind with the Linux and Rust for Linux is that from my understanding of LPC, the point is still to try and get a minimum Rust version that is stable and that contains all the currently unstable stuff that they need. And once that is done, uh, they will keep that pinned for a long time. So that's not the current Rust version because what they need is still unstable in the current Rust version. But once that happens, this is also a version that can target and pin and do everything correctly. So I just want to I'd take what David said the other way around and not to underestimate the importance of GCC to the Rust Foundation and the existing Rust compiler. Actually, part of the Rust is doing the classic thing of a new language, single compiler defined by its single language defined by it. The language is defined by its compiler. And it's not the first language that's been the case for. That's happened many, many times. And a project starts to mature as you start to get alternative tools. So this is actually a really important project, not just for GCC, 
but for the wider Rust community, because it actually starts to put a stake in the ground. That's why it's actually quite important it goes into GCC 13, if at all possible, because it will actually take the whole Rust movement forward, because there are now two users. And I think you know, you've listed things there. We know from talking to, A, there's a lot of people using Rust and waiting for a GCC Rust to be there. Secondly, that the lack of um, borrow checking isn't a stopper. It's got to be there eventually. Um, but having, you know, that, that can come later. And I think you're right, though. It's getting the right libcore support. It's the next guys can fly. That's probably the critical thing. Yeah, I think part of it's they've also requested their own unstable features as well as part of that. So hopefully they will start this stabilization process sooner than later. Uh, for the changes on the release branches, I think there could be two approaches. One would be to yeah, yeah, uh, start with, with, with whatever latest version you had at the po uh, point before branching, and then just watch at, at each six weeks what, what kind of changes there are. If, if they could be considered only bug fixes, then, then you can just update it and, and it would be fine. If, if there is something changing ABI or some major changes in the compiler, then one of the possible approach, well, uh, either you could just stop at, at that point and declare this, this release branch stops at, at this version and is not updated anymore, or you could go with, with an option where users could select, uh, I want Rust version, from this month or something similar, and and but you, you would need to be able to support the different versions. Mm. So, on the compiler side, I guess that's that's possible with with some extra effort. Yeah. Like like uh, for instance, C plus plus frontend has has the minus std and and supports many different mm. versions. I it has the advantage that it's every three years and not yeah. every six weeks. <laughs> uh, but on the library side. There could be problems if, if you change uh, how, how some function is called. And yeah, so on. they use a thing called a prelude to try and select things there we have to try and copy. Um, oh, I was going to say something, I forgot what it was now. <laughs> oh, maybe come back to me. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I think at least in, initially, it's probably a no brainer to basically keep the, the development rust also committed to the GC13 branch to basically mirror changes there because it's going to be still experimental. And, and uh, it, it helps at least the users that are courageous enough to try to not also run into the experimental GCC stuff. It, it, might, it might also be then that not actually upstreaming it yet, but just making the a, a Rust development branch based on the stable GCC yeah. available is the more sensible approach. But I guess for, for marketing, also on the GCC side, it's nice to say, well, now we have yeah. also Rust experimental. <laughs> yeah, that's, very, a, very, that's very the real silent, problem. Right? That, yeah. uh, and and, and, and with, with Jakob saying the C++ frontend has minus standard, whatever, you, you can do minus standard and the, the Rust C version yeah. Right. That's your standard version. It's the Rust yeah. C release, and if if there's a breaking feature, then you can. Yeah. See, the users can specify the exact version, and you can try to be compatible. I'm not <laughs> sure if that's going to scale, but. Yeah. See, that's our greatest. I don't know. Fear is too strong a word, but uh, we're sort of racing to try and get libcore working before November because if that's not there, I just don't think it looks good for us right now. And so, in theory, it's really closures are the things holding us back. Because, as I mentioned earlier, you can't do four loops without this lib core working. And so, I think it. It's really built in. Okay, yeah. It's a, it's a specific crate, so it's just like a, a set of Rust files that you can compile. It's like it's not within the compiler. It's within the compiler's repository, it's not yeah. embedded in the compiler or embedded in the binary or anything. It does. It it's like magic uh, attributes and thing there to tell the compiler to yeah. do specific things, though. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah. 
Yeah, but I, I want to read it. I mean, exactly what Richard was saying. Like, this is going to be an experimental. It's going to be a preview. It's going to be a proto, whatever you want to call it. But that's going to be the preliminary release. And so, I mean, yeah. Richard is one of the release managers, and uh, Joseph's here. But I mean, the release managers can give you the latitude to be able to, uh, you know, evolve this more quickly. And people will know this is experimental. But uh, you know, also. You know, I, I, I'll push back on your November date. Look, GCC 13 is going to be released in April or you know, May, and sometime in spring. That's the date. It's not about what is useful, what's working on the date that we actually do the merge. And I'm going to ins really insist you will get GCC Rust into GCC 13. Period. Okay? Why so, this, So the, I think, yeah, some of the concern here is that if you merge it before it's ready, then I think there will be a really negative backlash from the rest of the Rust community. That's exactly the point. I wanted to make a first-hand experience with the open ACC support in GCC. We were, well, we did the development or started that and were very eager to get it upstreamed and got that into the I think GCC 5 release as a preview kind of thing was labeled as such in the manual. Um, people tried that, found it didn't suit their needs for obvious reasons because lots of things were not implemented or not performant. And still now, eight years later, we're here, okay, you, you can't use GCC with OpenACC because of the experience they had eight years ago or read somewhere that somebody had such an experience. So you have to be careful. On, on one hand, I totally understand getting in the upstream. On the other hand, it may leave a bad impression if it's not useful. Uh, two, oh, two concrete suggestions. Um, I don't know if they're good ones. Um, I know GLX Gears, at one point I think you had to compile it with dash D, I know this is not a benchmark in order to, <laughs> um, but perhaps um, naming in the dash dash enable languages, first of all disable it by default and have dash dash enable language call it rust dash preview and instead of the binary being GCC RS be GCC RS dash preview so that it's the thing the user types yeah. and sees on the command line and puts in their make file, they are explicitly yeah. saying, saying preview, blah, blah, blah. And this is, this is a pro, that, you know, it's messaging that. Mm -hmm. The second question or the second observation is, um, is there other ways we can minimize the delta between your branch and Chunk? Is there stuff that we can land in Chunk for GCC 13 that is purely useful to you, but will make minimize the difference between yeah. you know, the, the amount of code that you haven't, you know, is hanging out in your branch. Yeah, there's like two patches that need to be there. Um, apart from that, eventually we'll need to figure out the, um, the target hooks thing. Eventually, hopefully, you'll figure that out with Ian. That's a fairly big thing to figure out all the CPU features, but we don't need it quite yet. But yeah, there's two patches that would help in the short term. I think we can talk ourselves into a deep depression here. Don't underestimate what it is. I mean, Philbert is terribly good at telling you all the things that don't work, not pointing out that most of it works extremely well. Um, so I think I'm with David on there. The, the, well, we've got to have enough there. I like uh, David Malcolm's suggestions of, of you know, naming it as preview, so it's very explicit. But I think we shouldn't underestimate the importance of timing if Linux is going to land Rust um, device driver support this year, us being a year late with anything is probably psychologically bad. So I think you know, there's lots of good suggestions here and we're actually a lot closer than perhaps you might get the impression from some of the discussion. I'll give it to you right after, sorry. Yeah, just to answer the rest for Linux thing, uh, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind is that Rust for Linux is targeting Rust 162. We're currently targeting Rust 149. We're failing at that. We're currently expanding Rust 129 correctly, failing the type checking on that. And I do think we have made great progress. Yeah. But I do think also that there's going to be a long, long time before we can actually compile Rust for Linux. It's just yeah. there is a lot of stuff to, to do still. 
because that's what we were mentioning earlier in the last talk about we need liballoc, we need, and libpanic is also needs compiler changes, but libproc is also the bigger one. It needs compiler changes, it needs an RPC server built in. You know, I do think uh, there's a good chance, like start of like summer next year, maybe like May, June time, that we could be in a position that's starting to work there. But yeah, we're sort of hoping everything comes together rather than being 100% sure. That once we get libcore gotten done, it helps everything. It's hard to, to have a good estimate until it's working. Yes, so, so just a quick comment on that and then my original thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is how this cousin works, right? Uh, so uh, I think it, it can be important to, to release GCC Rust with something just also to attract more developers because if you can more easily get your hands on something, then it's also easier to contribute. Mm -hmm. Just to comment on, on what everything is missing for the kernel, th kernel side. And then uh, on, on whether to release or not, and whether it's good <coughs> for marketing or bad. I mean, uh, for, from the release manager side, we give you a lot of discretion, uh, discretion here. So we just say, we, we, uh, the steering committee said, well, yeah, we, we will accept Rust. The steering committee didn't uh, pro uh, propose any any constraints here, so we just say, well, yeah, the release will happen somewhere in mm -hmm. in spring, and uh, I think we give you the the chance to to merge things, and we can still ship basically without it, with the configury just being disabled, and and we then hope that distributors don't enable it anyway and ship it, right? <laughs> That's, that's, uh, the, the three of us, the three of us, because that would be then against the decision. So, so basically, at the point, at the week before we, re we yeah. release, you can say, well, uh, it didn't work out, so we can yeah. disable it. And But we will have dot releases on the GC13 branch. Well, no. If you can fix it, we can also ship it enabled with 13.3. Yeah. Of course, 13.3 will be when 14.1 will be. But yeah, so if you're just a few weeks late, yeah, you can enable, we can enable it uh, a few months later. So we that, that shouldn't be an issue. But it, the important thing is not basically some labeling, but marketing it correctly with blog posts, with whatever that co that then carries the message of here's what works, here's what doesn't work, here's where we need help, and that, that not the false impression. Yes, well, GCC now has Rust. Yeah, right. That's mm. probably what our release notes will say. But <laughs> well, you, you, you need more. I mean, we, we will live in, in the social media world, so you need, you need to do the social, the social media in, in the correct way. But basically, it, it will be your decision one week before the release whether it's there or not. And up until then, you can just think it will be there. So we are going to be optimistic and yeah. not talking us into a depression. <laughs> but but, 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 but we will we'll have a, a way out if, in case it doesn't work out because shit happens, you know. Yeah. We even, uh, maybe you're going to say this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I do want to be optimistic as well. I don't want to be like the Great Depression. A lot of stuff works. I just think it's important that we think about how we market that as you put it forward. Because if for example, it's called GCCRS, and people suddenly believe that you can compile uh, Rust C129 crates, and then they start opening issues on the, the Rust code that these other people have been making. It's going to give a very bad impression of our work, because, I mean, I just, I just yeah. do think that we have to think about marketing it properly yeah. and it's making sure that no one expects a perfect compiler from the start, yeah. <laughs> because it's not going to be. In, 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 in GCC, we do have the, the sorry thing to automate. So if, 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 you, if you can make sure if you run into code you know you don't support, say, sorry, that's not yet implemented. We know about that. Yeah. That, that helps instead of just error, uh, house error whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> Yeah, basically all he said. But um, <laughs> I, 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 I think there are uh, one decision is being part of GCC and following all that process. And then if you 
decide that's for us, <laughs> uh, then you can uh, add experimental flags. Or uh, uh, for Valgrind, we have uh, experimental tools, and they're all called exp which nobody remembers stands for experimental, but they shoot and mm -hmm. uh, then they're not, uh, even if we ship them, uh, uh, people have to call them slightly differently and they have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> So what is the goal for the GCC 13 branch? Is it to have some stable Rust release with some point release in GCC or to have... <laughs> you know, we, GCC is very weird because we, we don't have kind of a development plan or product managers who decide on features. It's just what, what you do happens and what you don't do, that doesn't happen, right? And then we have some kind of quality control, but that uh, on paper only applies to C and C++. Then again, you have some, well, wishes or requirements that, that some Rust versions from Windows. <laughs> Um, another idea, possible um, suggestion, um, a patch for the maintainers file to add uh, you guys oh. as the maintainers <laughs> of the Rust thing that isn't yet in the tree, but it does at least give you, you know, empower you, you know, you're blessed by the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, as soon as it's, it's committed, I mean, I think the steering committee is, is you know, welcome to have them. I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem now of when it, you're actually going to start putting patches, but you're still doing development in your own tree. So with doing your own tree, you're sort of... But it's a, um, a way of breaking that chicken and egg cycle to say, it isn't in there yet, but you're free to go for it. Well, well that's what I'm saying. What, I, it's not so much that it's a matter of you know, when there is actually a patch approved because, I mean, look, at least traditionally the way that it's worked with GCC for any new port, you know, back in the front is that you had this initial patch and we've said that, okay, the steering committee approves in concept. I mean, legally we're saying you can do it, but then it's up to some global reviewer saying, okay, this initial patch passed muster and then we hand it over to the actual maintainers. So, so it's... You, <laughs> right. But 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 exactly. But I, I want to exactly follow up on, on what we were just discussing, you know, uh, with with Mark and with Jeremy. That uh, you know, in, in some of it, like a lot of people are doing things because you know, innovation happens because somebody is scratching an itch. Is the way it's it. In other words, if we have GCC 13 with Rust available in it and Rust is then used in the kernel, it's not just a matter of it's available and it's attracting developers just because it's available and easier to use. It's a matter that once it's there, and yes, I mean, I, I completely agree with getting the marketing correct about this and people's expectations, but once it's there, and there definitely are people who are very big fans of, of Rust-C and the LLVM ecosystem and using that and using that to build Linux, and there are a lot of people who are very adamant about using GCC and want to use that to build the Linux kernel and the Linux ecosystem. So once it's there and people are trying to build it, then they'll say, oh, this is a target, this is a goal, this is now what I'm trying to hit, with not just you, you know, not just Embicosm and, and the open source security and the people and, and Oracle, who we thank you know, immensely for all the work so far, but once, the broader Linux, you know, whoever is trying to use Rust has this target saying, oh, I want GCC to Rust to build my project. And I understand it's experimental. It's like, where does it fail? And then all of a sudden you've got a deluge of people saying, oh, I can fix that. Oh, I, can, I tried to build it. Oh, I can fix that. Right now there's sort of nothing for them to target. So that's why I'm saying if we get it just out there in people's hands, they say, oh, and whatever module, whatever it is, you know, it, it's Rust 1.6, whatever the bleep it is. Mm -hmm. And they say, okay, you know, Oh, you know, it, it, GCC Rust supports 129, and we need 126. Oh, and this thing's break. Oh, mm. I can fix that. Oh, you know, that's when people just start coming in out of the, you know, out of nowhere and sending you patches and just fixing things because they personally have, for whatever their motivation, which you know, God bless them, they have, you know, they want to get, they want to get their project working. They don't care about anything. All of a sudden, you know, 
my project doesn't work, and I, you know, and I personally, for wonderful reasons, want to use GCC Rust, or, or I'm just, you know, want to get some of my resume, I, whatever their motivation. It's like there's now a target, and they're now going to fix it for you, and that's when people are going to start, you know, stepping up and, and helping. So that's where I think is a really important motivation: get this there early, you know, and to be able to have more people with a an, an easier access and with, you know, and, and something that they can now start chewing on, and that they will then help. I mean, hopefully, we're hoping that that's that's how the communities work, and that's how people get motivated to participate. Yeah, and I think it's good to have more people working. Oh, sorry, did anyone know? Okay, and uh, yeah, I, I guess, again, it just comes down to marketing it correctly, and yeah. A proposal for a concrete work in the GCC 13 release notes would be something like, um, New, you know, new features in GCC 13, an experimental preview of GCC RS <laughs> is made available for the first time in, in GCC 13. We, we, um, it is explicitly not for use in production. It is purely intended for those who want to kick the tires, quotes or something like that. Yeah. And we expect numerous issues. Um, please, it, but we are releasing it now in the, because uh, in the spirit of release early, release often. Um, we hope that it will be more stable in GCC 14 and um, something like that. Um, we even toyed with the, a joke of like, we could do like minus F, don't use this. <laughs> and it would cyst on exit, you know, if you don't like specify it. <laughs> so so with, with, with Rust, there's like a central registry of all Rust code that exists, basically. So yeah, they have one repository for everything. So, so what, what you can easily do is try to compile everything and have a huge table and mark everything that you know that doesn't work. Then, yeah, that's a good point where and Arthur that, talks in. Yeah, that's what we're doing already. Yeah. So we have a big testing project running through that Rusty test suite, trying to compile the Rust libcore library. That's your expectation. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good point. We've been using it just ourselves to see if we've yeah. broken anything. And it, it's supposed to be available on the website, but we're shit at web devil. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Like we actually have a different pipeline to Rusty. We like Rusty has an awful lot more passes. So I think in theory we could be faster, but I don't like saying that because <laughs> it'll probably be wrong later. <laughs> Hi, I'm just wondering if you can go into some more detail on uh, the target hooks that you need. Uh, you mentioned you need some new target hooks for Rust. So. Oh yeah, so there's a, a create. Uh, I can't remember, is it SIMD create or if it's in standard or lib standard, I can't remember which, but it likes to specify, oh, is this an ARM chip and is it this specific ARM chip and can I call this intrinsic? And so it, it kind of needs to know those strings. And so I copied all um, a bunch of code from the D front end before to try and get all of this. Um, we actually don't need it right now because libcore doesn't require this. We just need target pointer size and endianness, and that's it for now, but we will need it later. Um, uh, I could show you offline what the way it looked in the different options uh, on my editor later if you're interested. Um, so it's just about like, does this CPU exist? Which CPU is this? Which sub bar target is this? Yeah. Quick question. So, um, you mentioned in the previous talk about inline assembly in Rust, and I'm just wondering how that looks, whether it looks quite similar to C inline assembly, and whether you sort of have the GCC style constraints and everything, or whether that's quite different. Uh, yeah, uh, we actually were discussing that with Antonio and we're plumbers. I think there's some reason we have to specify the Intel syntax or something like that. It's one feature we haven't done yet either. Yeah. It should fairly map over quite closely, so I'm not totally worried about it. And Antonio's already got it working, so I can still code from the JIT front end if I need it. <laughs> it's, it's part of the built-in macros, and yeah. it's part of the big ones that we need to think about very soon, like format arguments. And yeah, we just haven't had much time to think about it yet. 
I think um, a big other thing that we'd like to discuss is that because the, we're making a Rust compiler, so we want to target people that will write Rust, so the Rust community, and the Rust community uses GitHub, uh, which you like it or you don't, I don't, no matter. That means that we probably have to keep our development on GitHub to make sure that people using the compiler can easily report issues, uh, post fixes, patches, pull requests, uh, all of that. And, yeah, well, <laughs> sorry, Mark. <laughs> and um, we were wondering also how, oh, okay. Uh, we were wondering also, does that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, how to work, keep the development on GitHub, and sometimes upstream them back to GCC once that is merged. And so we know that people from Ada or other front ends like the D front end uh, are doing that as well, I believe. So, yeah. So I believe that when you absolutely insist on using the GitHub issue tracker and uh, submit request thing, that you still should merge into upstream GCC, which does have a GitHub mirror, which you can then basically rebase on and you should not like have the GitHub version have more changes than the upstream GCC thing. And then like like Edacore does its corporate internal patches, they, they upstream them in, in batches basically for reasons, right? Mm. But it's a corporate thing and you should work with the GCC community and not with the GitHub community. I'm not calling it the yeah. Rust community because you should also work with the Rust community. One of the, the so uh, please try to try to at least not be ahead of the GCC yeah. official, official repository. See, so we've been able to link issues directly to Rust issues, which has been helpful to get that sort of cross pollination thing. So oh. I mean, I mean there's, in Baxilla there's C also, so you can refer to Rust issues, if you like. But, mm. but do expect people to also file Bugzilla bugs. And yeah, yeah. Please look at them. Yeah. Um, and, and you can mirror them on the GitHub site yourself if you think that that makes more sense for you and your workflow. Yeah. But, but from, the, from the source code repository side, please take the GCC one as the master, so the development branch, and just, yeah. you can merge to, to GitHub if you like and, and accept pull requests basically yeah. in, in, in whatever convenient way that's then possible, probably not with accept because that will push to that one first. But yeah, just figure it out yourself. But yeah, it's definitely try, to, possible. try to keep the GCC repository the master. My, I wanted to also make the point, changes can also go first into GCC master branch, the upstream, and then be merged back into the GitHub branch. So. Yeah. We've been pretty flexible with that so far. It's, it's, it's mostly historical. We've been using GitHub, and it was just that was the handiest, cool thing to do, I guess. But I think Mark Relard's made a lot of progress in helping us an awful lot with your build bots, which has been a really interesting thing. <laughs> well, so that was kind of my... So we set up a GC mailing list, so... People can send in batches by email, and I do, and nobody else. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure uh, I'm helping enough. Um, I, 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 I do, uh, I'm, I, I am a bit worried about uh, the, the, uh, uh, split development. Uh, 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 and but I also kind of acknowledge that the way uh, GCC uh, works isn't the, uh, 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 how you are productive. <laughs> you are pr productive kind of precisely because you are using several GitHub 
uh, uh, things. Um, so, um, the, uh, uh, I, I do have a buff on infrastructure changes that uh, I think will help make email based development easier. Mm. Um, uh, please attend that buff. And, <laughs> and, 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 and no, and, and, and be honest, uh, it's. Um, it, it's it's a it's a different development model, and uh, we, we yeah. have to bridge that somehow. Yeah, we've kind of drank the Kool Aid with pull requests. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, so I, I think we, we, we can do that. With, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I think we can do that uh, more structured with an email based development, but that kind of also requires changes from the GCC mm. development com uh, community yeah. uh, in being more structured with email. Yeah. And, uh, so, we, we, so, so it's a discussion that yeah. we probably should have. And I, I hope to have a bit of that discussion in that mm. buff on Sunday. So we've been taking advantage of like a lot of automation, such as like you know fixes and closes tickets automatically for us, yeah. which is kind of cool. And I think it's also important to remember that sending uh, bugs or patches via email is difficult. And it's hard, and I know I think you're above if it's going to help. I'm all look, I'm looking forward to that. But the Rust community is also prides itself on its openness and the fact that everyone can contribute and comment on. RFCs and yeah. proposals for the compiler. And I think it's important that we keep that. Uh, I'm not against switching away from GitHub as long as it's easy for everyone to still contribute. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm going to be GitHub advocate here and say, um, has a long term GCC, on nine years of GCC, and my one patch that I sent to you or whatever, <laughs> it was such a, oh my goodness me, it's GitHub, I can send a pull request. And there was such a feeling, this is so much easier than dealing with mailing lists and, mm. um, and all the rest. Um, and I guess the other, the, there may be, a, I think there's a generational thing here, which is those of us who've been involved in free software or open source, say since the 1990s and blah, 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 blah. It's all, oh, mailing lists, the CVS yeah. repository, or, and you know, if, if you've used a CVS repository, um, yeah. then, and all of that, and yes, mailing lists are old hat, and, um, and all of that, oh yeah, John, blah, 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 and the, and the Bugzilla instance. But I think there's a whole generation of, of new developers coming up who GitHub is the, the default. Yeah. And uh, yeah. See, I think like it's been interesting because we are using, um, we have all this automation. So every time you submit a PR, it checks your code formatting and if it builds and checks regressions. But on top of that, when we merge, we use a, a bot called Boars. So we've never actually had a regression ever since we've, been, we've had Boars in over a year and a half um, on our front end, at least for x86. <laughs> um, so that's been incredibly useful for new people because you just have so much more confidence that you're not regressing. <laughs> but let the two get muddled. I'm with David here. I think it, it's time to move on to the pull request model. I think it's got lots of advantages, but that's not what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve G and must upstream, play with the upstream rules. If you don't like those rules, have a separate effort. I just wanted to say, someone representing the younger generation, I haven't ever developed with email development, but to me, it sounds scary. Yeah. <laughs> I can just say that as someone who started only about two, three years ago working with GCC and the new tool chain, the first like five patches sending up to the mailing list is quite scary. I think that I've personally come to actually like it quite a bit. But the GitHub, um, the GitHub process, which again, this is kind of a separate topic that maybe we should discuss somewhere else, um, is a lot more, uh, people are much more used to it 
coming out of you know young people coming up who have just graduated from school. They probably used GitHub in school and have never sent a patch to a mailing list. Don't know how to format a patch for an email. So. Yeah. So so first and foremost, what you're giving up with being part of GCC is control over the release, right? Because you will be a, firstly you will be a second class citizen inside GCC. Right, because you're experimental and not important, only C and C++. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're, you don't need to give up on, on, on your current development workflow. I, I think it would be a bad time to do that. Maybe later yeah. we converge on something common. I mean, it took us only 10 years to move from SVN to Git. So maybe it yeah. takes 20 years to move from email-based yeah. to Whatever is then hip, it might not be GitHub anymore in 20 years. But yeah, yeah, it's very true. I don't, I don't like being like stuck on it. I think source hot is kind of interesting, but yeah, yeah. hopefully over time Rust will stabilize and it, it makes more sense at that point. You know, um, we're still in quite a lot of heavy development churn, and you know. <laughs> Uh, this must be an early, might be an early question, but do you intend in the future to have the Rust be, uh, the front end be self-hosting, so written in Rust itself? Yeah, well, so that's... Um, yes, 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 yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, long term, yes, yeah. so I hope yeah. it will look like the Ada front end long term. Yeah, it's so much nicer to write a compiler in Rust. It's <laughs> actually amazing. But we would like to be conservative and keep the bootstrapping chain... Yes. Um, Correct. That we can like control sound. it. Yeah, so we'd like to have a first version of GCCRS be able to compile the second version of GCCRS written in Rust. But definitely, yeah. I think this is something that we want. Yeah. This is something that I want. And yeah. In theory, though, there's that process where they're trying to split out the Rust-C compiler into reusable components. Yeah. It would actually make it a lot easier to maintain this long term. So and it's not as integrate hard. Integrate with some of the components that are formally proven, uh, such as the upcoming Chalk or Polonius, which are verifiable models of either the trade system yeah. or the borrow checking, borrow check. Yeah, you, you, uh, Polonius will be in Rust, so you... Polonius will be in, used by Rust, but will stay as a separate library. Yeah, but that, that does mean you will be using Rust. To ah, okay, that's what you mean. I thought we'll be in Rust-C. Yeah, Polonius is written in Rust. So right now, uh, on the very experimental branch that integrates with Polonius and tries to do some sort of borrow checking that I've started, uh, we have an FFI layer to go from Rust to C to C++ back again. And it would just be yeah, <laughs> easier to not have that. So um, building new Rust versions uh, usually requires having the um, last Rust version available. Um, will it be possible to, to build the GCC RS from GCC 14 with the Rust from GCC 13? So, or how do you put the next GCC Rust version? No, no. It, at the moment, it's really in C++. But that, that's what I was saying when yeah. I uh, when I said that I want to keep the bootstrapping chain active is that we'll be able to keep doing that without relying on another compiler, hopefully. We'll try, we'll strive to achieve that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I mean, let me explain what I understand this, because I think the people are missing how the bootstrap is supposed to work, that basically the Rust, GCC Rust, GCC RS is written in C++. It's like a standard C++ front end that GCC currently G++ compiles. Polonius, as they said, is written in Rust, but the bootstrap would be initially that because, again, you know, it, whether or not with borrow check or not, it's, it's not Rust, fine. But I mean, the language itself functions without the borrow checking. So you would build the first stage one version of GRS without Polonius. This isn't what you'd use in production, it's not official Rust, whatever, but you use that stage one compiler, that you have a stage one Rust compiler to then compile Polonius, which you link into stage two. So this is how you bootstrap each time. You don't need to have, it's not like ADA where you needed, you know, GCC, you know, you know 3.2 to you know, ADA to be able to do GCC 3.3 ADA. It's that you're always, in, at least initially, you're always going to be able to 
completely bootstrap Rust with GCCRS, with the compiler, and that the first stage would not have, Polonius would not have the borrow checker and would be in, you know, operating illegally, whatever terminology you want to use. But then that, without the borrow checking, would then be able to compile the Rust code that's needed for stage two, and then you'd have the full compiler for future, and that's what would then be your stage three compiler that you actually release. I mean, that, that's the full build for a normal GCC bootstrap. Does that, was I correct, and does that explain it for people who are confused about how bootstrap would work? Yeah, yeah, that's very correct. Uh, that's exactly how we plan on doing so. Uh, there is actually a blog post that's going to be released yeah. on the Rust Foundation website that's going to explain that with nice schemas and graphs and everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, but what I, when I was talking about the bootstrapping thing, I meant that the first version of GCCRS should be able to compile GCCRS in a, like, released the year after so that we would keep that alive. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, like, like with the lib standard C++, it's always compiled with the version of the compiler that it ships with. So your Rust runtime, if its parts have written in Rust, it should be always built with the Rust compiler you are building. You are never using the host Rust compiler to build your Rust runtime from the newer version. So you shouldn't have this issue if you are not writing your front end in Rust. So because you're never using the old compiler. Yeah. At least that should be the idea. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is still a very far away topic, so, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned with the GitHub testing, you were testing on x86. I was just wondering if you, you've tested it on, on other targets at all. That's Mark. <laughs> so we do have like a whole build bot suite. I can't remember all the architecture off the top of my head. There's a bunch. There's, there's Power PC, yeah. Spark. Uh, I don't remember. I don't think there's some ARM. On no, there is ARM. There on is it, actually. Uh, yeah. ARM there's 64 for sure. Failures on uh, Big Endian, and that's nothing to do with us. Yeah. Our code generation is to do with our parser is yeah. not quite correct for config expansion in one case, and so some of those tests fail. And uh, there's basically an if def for a big endian in a couple of test cases, and our parser doesn't quite handle it quite right. <laughs> but it's we know what the bug is. We've known it for a while. It's not a big deal right now, though. But it's nothing to do with regenerating code wrong. But if you do want to provide ARM machines for us to <laughs> test on it, feel yeah. free. You know. <laughs> uh, on ARM 64, we actually do a bootstrap, uh, and on x86. Uh, x86, 64 also. Uh, ARM32 uh, is a problem that's just too slow, mm. at least the one we, we have. Uh, and uh, you do indeed have a problem on S390X and PowerPC64, mm. Big India. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of if tests for Big India, and it's just the way we handle block syntax isn't quite right, so that's why there's some failures there. But yeah. <laughs> one minute. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. only one thing I was, I think I'm probably misheard or whatever, but whenever, say for instance, all, everything goes well, we're accepted we're accept to merge, obviously. Does that mean we have to merge before Christmas or does that mean we can merge right up to before the release goes out? What way does that work? Or do we have to merge like the Christmas tech? Okay. So, 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 so what? So I, I think what you, what you should try to do is um, before the end of stage three, which then happens at the end of the year basically, have at least uh, all parts merged that touch the rest of CGC. That means the configure, the, the, the basic setup of your front end direct directory, right? Yeah. Up, up to the actual enablement of the language, which but, but everything you do in your front end private directory, you can basically do it up until the last day. If you break uh, it the last day, it's your fault. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, as, as I said, you're second <laughs> class, you're not C and you're not C++. Yeah, yeah that would be a problem with the set. Of, the version two of the patches, it has everything, but what I could do is a version of the patches, which is just like, just the skeleton front end with those changes, I could do. Okay. Uh, where, where last day is actually one week before, basically want to avoid any, any changes the, the week before release.
again, I'll, I'll leave it to, to, to Jakob and, and Richie as the release managers for exactly what they want to allow in. But again, the basic concept is that we want new features in. I mean, the basic you know, structure, the basic plan is to have new features in during, you know, before the end of stage three, before we get into bug fixing. And that includes everything. So okay. that includes all the directives that this entire patch, but that, you know, we, it should only after that be bug fixes for the common parts of GCC that Richie is saying, but that the parts that are Rust specific, you can keep fiddling with up until the last minute or, you know, or at least the last week and, you know, whatever breaks, you know, at the last minute, that's, you know, on you. But the thing is to put all of this in before the end of the year, but then you have flexibility in your control your bits and you can make further changes to that in more invasive ways up through until you know we actually get into the release so i think i mean again richie can correct me if i'm wrong but i think he's saying he wants everything that is to be that that touches the common parts of gc configuring and anything that you need need to change in the common parts of the middle end or anything that you know that all should be you know yeah. locked in and again, only bug fixes, but locked in, and in, in that no aggressive, no major changes to that by the end of the year. But the rest of it, you're free to have more flexibility, but it would be good to have all of the bits in, at least a preliminary version of all the bits into the repository by the end of the year. Okay. Yeah, so that might actually include also all the Rust specific changes in the target directories. Mm. Because there it's really up to the target maintainers to decide yeah. if the, what they let you do after that kind of point, right? Yeah. So if you like, if you say, oh, we have to for each target implement a set of hooks or whatever, in in which is of course Rust specific and unlikely mm. to break anything else, but still it's the target maintainers say, and you need their okay in that case. Yeah. Yeah, we pulled those changes out because we don't need them right now, but we will need them. So, yeah, we'll have to look at that again. Sorry. I had a specific thing, which is, are you still using the logging thing that's sort of shared with JIT <laughs> and the analyzer? I would love to use it, but we're not using it at the moment. We ended up just doing like a minus F Rust verbos. Okay. I would love a shared logger in GCC, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> About the, the target hooks that bring some more general questions, which configurations you cons or we, I guess, uh, consider supported initially because we, we don't have to support all GCC yeah. configurations initially and then on, only also need the target hooks for the supported ones, so that's maybe a handful or something. Yeah, I would say we'd not, probably be pretty conservative there for yeah, our first set. Not like no. that there has been a preliminary implementation of the target hooks where the person uh, tried to implement them for all backends that GCC has, just guessing what the appropriate yeah. values might be. So that's not feasible. So that's why that was pulled out again. Yeah. Just, just focus on targets you think you've tested. Just try to focus on, on a handful of targets you can actually test. Yeah, and that you think are important. When, when I would guess it would be x86 and ARM, <laughs> um, but probably some people in the room would, would include some more targets. Uh, Hopefully, so. contributors will do that for us. That's what I'd hope. Ah, we have to stop. Is that, uh, <laughs> we, we can keep going offline or during the coffee break. Yeah, yeah. But thank you, everyone. Yeah. Oh, well, perfect. Where you can beat us up to this and. Okay. okay. Thank you all for the comments. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>